Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with another one of those fabulous lists that you suggested. One of you suggested to me, gee, why don't you do a list of the 10 most emotionally draining works of music? And I said, oh, that sounds like fun. I love to have my emotions drained, don't you? Well, I put it together, but it's not just one list. We're going to be doing two. We're going to be doing orchestral works and vocal works because you've got to separate them out. And, you know, there's so much emotional drainage in the classical music world. You can't just limit it to 10 pieces. So we're going to have a lot of fun with this one. And I know you're going to have your own ideas of what constitutes emotional drainage. I do want to make one point, however, before we get to the list, which is down below, as always with these things. I post the, the names. First of all, as with most of these lists, these are about works, not performances, although I may mention one because I've done videos on most of them separately anyway. Anyway, that's number one. And number two, I, I really think it's important when we, we do these things that we bear in mind <laughs> that um, everybody's going to have their own view of this. You know it. I know it. And so I really welcome your own opinions about things that I may not have included. But don't tell me I forgot one. Just add it. It's fine. I didn't forget it. I left it out because it wasn't on my list. And the other thing, the final thing, which I guess is the third thing, is this. The fact that something is emotionally draining doesn't mean necessarily that it's like tragic or miserable. It means a powerful example of the range of emotions it can extract from you. And so when it's over, you could feel very good. I mean, we do feel good. We feel good even when things are miserable. Why do we enjoy listening to miserable things? Because somehow they make us feel better. That's the paradox, the paradox of, of tragedy, that, that purgative sort of uh, experience that we, what we want after we listen to an emotionally draining piece of music. You go, oh, and you just feel completely at peace with the universe or not. Anyway, here's the list. So you're ready? Number one, and number one, it's probably the most obvious of them all, but we have to start here. Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, the Patetique, which ends with the absolutely iconic musical description of total, complete despair and defeat and utter misery. That's the end of the Patetique, isn't it? And I remember, I remember one of my favorite gramophone reviews for complete vacuous nonsense was a review of, of the Bernstein, you know, the Bernstein New York Phil Deutsche Gramophone recording with the one with the 18 minute finale or however long it is. It's twice as long as it normally is and absolute black darkness at the end. And, you know, one of one of the and the critics said something, you know, rather sniffily, you know, oh, it's it's not it's not the sort of pathetique for average daily listening. And I just thought to myself, who wants to listen to the Patetique on an average day? Never mind whether it's Bernstein's performance. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's absolutely crazy. You want? You mean you want your emotionally tepid one for for normal days when you're like doing the laundry, and then you want your heavy duty suicidal one for days when you're in some sort of mood? I mean, maybe that's how that person listens to music. I don't know. I don't. And uh, that was one of those remarks that always stuck with me in my you know, journey towards becoming a music critic. But anyway, anyway, Tchaikovsky, Symphony Number no. 6. That's the first one. Second one, the Sook Azrael Symphony. I mean, most people, you know, when I was growing up, no one even heard of that thing. No one heard of Joseph Sook. We thought he was a violinist. He was the grandson of the composer, Joseph Sook, or Yosef Sook, I guess, if it's in Czech. And the Azrael Symphony, Azrael is the angel of death. He wrote the piece after the, the death of his wife and Dvorak, who was his father-in-law. And it was a piece, it's a piece full of, of lamenting and despair and darkness. And, but it does come to an ultimately peaceful conclusion in C major, to which Sook, you know, he said, you have no idea what that C major conclusion cost me. And uh, you sort of get an idea if you're listening to it along the way. It's in five movements. It's an absolute masterpiece of late 
you know, early 20th century, late 19th century romantic histrionics. And if you don't know it, you really should. It's just, it's just splendid. There are wonderful recordings of it out now. It's been recorded, oh goodness, uh, probably nearly a dozen times. And so it's, it's very easy to find excellent, excellent performances. Some of the best are, are Neumann did it, and, and Macaris did it, and Kubelik did it, and, you know, a lot of famous people did it. And boy, is it great, absolutely great. So the Azrael Symphony number three, well, Mahler Symphony Number no. 6, The Tragic. This is one of the very few symphonies that is actually tragic. I mean tragic in the classical Greek sense. That is, it, it depicts in music the struggle of a romantic hero against the forces of destiny, a struggle that the romantic hero is destined to lose. And it's fascinating to you know analyze the work and see how Mahler actually does it. Uh, the, the short end of it is that he does it by embedding within the the tunes of striving in heroism the same rhythmic motifs and elements which which determine the identity of fate, which is basically a simple chord, a major chord turning into a minor chord, and a rhythm, which is that's fate. <laughs> it's easy, isn't it? And so that rhythm is sort of involved in all of the tunes in the symphony, and gradually they become more and more prominent until there is nothing left but fate itself, and the whole thing collapses. And oh my God, what a great piece. And one of the things I realized about Mahler's Six, having performed it numerous times, is that, is that far from making you feel miserable and depressed because of the sad outcome, it is the, one of the most exhilarating pieces of music in the entire repertoire. I mean, when it was over, when we were performing it, we were like, yeah, let's do it again. I mean, it's so much fun to play and just so powerful. And, and it, it absolutely, I think, is the iconic example of what I, I mean when I say that, that something that's emotionally draining isn't necessarily depressing. It's, it's just, it's an invigorating work. And you come away from it just feeling somehow better, even though you've just witnessed this uh, or heard this unbelievably tragic story because it's all so powerful. It all has such such substance to it. You know, you just feel like you've really accomplished something when you get to the end. What a great piece it is. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So Mahler number six is definitely number three. Number four, this one may surprise you. Haydn's The Seven Last Words of the Savior on the Cross in its original orchestral version. This is an amazing work. There's nothing like it in the entire classical period. It's seven slow movements, um, one right after the other, although they are pieces of extraordinary variety and, and textural diversity, um, preceded by an introduction and then a concluding earthquake a minute and a half of orchestral mayhem. And it became Haydn's most popular work. Um, and when it was written, so as you know, it was arranged for string quartet and for piano, and Haydn himself made an arrangement uh, as an oratorio for chorus and soloists and orchestra, and he added some things, and the, the, the vocal version is splendid all by itself entirely differently. But but the original orchestral version is the one to listen to. I've done a video about it. You could have a look for recording recommendations. But my God, what an amazing piece of music that is. And it so belies the the reputation of Haydn and Mozart to some extent as, you know, classical composers, meaning pleasing, dainty, pleasant, you know, music of no particular consequence. It's a work of extraordinary depth and interiority, and uh, the music is incredibly beautiful and f very, very well contrasted. Not all of it is unhappy, even though each you know movement depicts one of the utterances of, of Jesus as he was dying on the cross. It's, it's a remarkable piece of music. It lasts about 50 minutes. There's nothing, like I said, there's nothing like it in the whole classical period. And I really believe it's one of the most emotionally draining and exalting pieces of music that there is. And the concluding earthquake is just the perfect ending because what happens in it is that, you know, we're, we are completely, completely immersed in, in, in the story and what's happening. And then Haydn brings us back to reality with this 
this tornado of sound that's completely contrasted to everything that's come before. It's, it's, it's an unbelievably smart and well-planned piece of music, and you really ought to get to know it if you don't. It's, it's an experience, a wonderful experience. So, number four. Number five, well... I mean, how could we talk about emotional drainage without discussing Alan Pedersen, his Symphony No. 8? That's always the iconic one that I go to and that I recommend that everybody listen to when they're starting out on their journey of getting through Alan Pedersen because everything that he wrote was pretty miserable. He was a, a, a sad, tragic, rather self-absorbed um, figure, and, and his symphonies are almost uniformly dark, and intense. And the reason I think the eighth is the best way to start um, if you want something that's really draining emotionally is that, first of all, most of his symphonies are big, long suckers in one movement. This one is in two movements, which means you get to inhale between the two movements. You know, after the first one's over, you can sort of go, okay, and get your energy up for part two. And part two uses mostly the same tunes that we all heard in part one. So it just picks up where where we left off and, and takes us to the pieces dark and despairing. Well, it's not always despairing, kind of uneasy, calm conclusion. It's a tremendous work. It really, really is. And if you like your emotional drainage to be dark, then Pedersen is your person because he's really going to give you your money's worth. There are marvelous recordings of this work, at least three of them now. Um, the best is probably the one on Bis. But um, there's one on CPO, I, there's, there's, there's one on Orfeo. It's surprising how many times it's been recorded. There's even one on Deutsche Grammophon with Sergio Comisione and the Baltimore Symphony that came out when I was in college in Baltimore and we were all excited and bought it and put it on and went, oh boy. Holy mackerel. So Pedersen is definitely in the emotional drainage department. Then, okay, here's one that's a little bit more on the normal side. Bruckner, Symphony Number no. 9. Bruckner's ninth, as it stands in its three-movement version, is one of the great emotionally draining late romantic extravaganzas, particularly because of the concluding adagio. Now, the fascinating thing about Bruckner 9 is that had he lived to complete the finale, which, as it stands from what we have, is an absolutely terrible piece of music. It's far inferior to everything else that's come before it. But had he lived to put a finale on that, on that symphony and it had it had its normal Brucknerian triumphal peroration at the end, I wouldn't have included it in this list at all. I don't think it would have belonged there. First of all, I think the finale would have taken it all down a notch, at least, again, based on what we have. And second of all, um, you know, the, the emotional journey would have been completely different. I mean, we know that it's Bruckner is going to have this finale, it's going to have a fugue, it's going to do its stuff. You know, who needs it? If you end it with the adagio, you have that perfect, perfect cathartic moment at the end when after that crunching dissonant climax that has like, you know, Godzilla stomping all over Tokyo or, or you know, Godzilla stomping all over Vienna in this case, you have that final turn to the major and the peaceful ending. And oh my goodness, it's just this transcendental moment and you can just go, Oh, yeah, because that's what an emotionally draining piece is, isn't it? You just want to exhale when it's over and just go, oh, yeah, you just feel limp, happily limp, like it's all just been flushed out of you. I don't mean to use these, you know, plumbing terminology, but, you know, we're talking about draining and drains involve plumbing. And so we're talking about your emotional plumbing being plumbed. It's been snaked out, and the Bruckner Ninth in its incomplete version does that. So next, oh yeah, we have to do a Shostakovich, don't we? And the most emotionally draining Shostakovich symphony, without question, is his eighth. It is an extraordinary, extraordinary piece of music, an honest piece of music. It's not one where he's trying to be, you know, somehow triumphant and socialist realist or anything like that. Nothing like it at all. He wrote it in the wake of World War II when he felt there was a moment sort of of safety where he could really express the horror and the destruction that he'd witnessed during the war. And the eighth reflects all of that. And again, it has another ending where it's not it's a wonderfully, it's possibly the most graphic depiction of emotional drainage 
in music because it, it just it just drains away. I mean, I'm like, yeah, what else can I say? That's it's the drainage that does it, and ends with just a simple C major chord. It's quite simple. Act. It's quite similar actually to the ending of the Azrael Symphony. That kind of uneasy, calm. I just don't have anything left. It it just ends because it can't literally can't go on, and and it's going to go on. We know that life goes on, so we have to simply just take it all in and sit back in, in a state of benumbed calm, and that's how that symphony ends. It's an entirely devastating take on the concept of of something which is emotionally draining. So Shostakovich eight is definitely on the list. Next, this one may surprise you, Nielsen, Symphony Number no. 5. See, the Nielsen 5th is, is a triumphant work. It's a work of, you know, extraordinary muscularity and, 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 and vivaciousness. But the first movement with that, that unbelievable climax in which, in which, you know, nobility and positiveness meet the forces of destruction and, and they fight off, they fight to an uneasy truce no one really wins. I mean, the, 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 the forces of positivity get over the hump, but the forces of destruction are not quite vanquished. That will be the business of the second movement, because it's only in two movements, but in multiple sections. And so the second movement has to reconstitute you know, our lives so that they can continue in a, in, in a positive vein. And it does so, and it does so in a way which is absolutely glorious. But I think that when you get to the end of that, it's like 32 minutes. It's not a long symphony, 35-ish minutes. It is one of the most, most emotionally satisfying pieces. It's emotionally draining that way. You're sated. You feel as though you've been put through the ringer and have gone through all of the possible phases of, of emotional intensity that you can go through. And the fact that Nielsen is kind enough to give us a, a triumphant ending, well, good for him. He has compassion. He has Rachmanus, as we say in Yiddish, for his listeners. He wants us to go away feeling really good about life and about where we are. And it's only because we've been through the, the depths that we can appreciate the heights. And so Nielsen 5 is definitely on my list of most draining, emotionally draining pieces of orchestral music. But we're down to the last two. Now, second to last, this one really, I, I think, is also one that may surprise some of you, but it's, it's a remarkable piece of music that doesn't get the credit it deserves for being the like astonishing masterpiece that it is. But it's Honegger, his third symphony, the Liturgique which has, you know, movements named after, you know, the Mass or the Requiem or whatever it is with Latin superscriptions, but they don't matter. What matters is the emotional journey that we go on. First, there is just this volcano of, of menace and destruction. Kind of sounds like Jaws, you know, it goes... Yeah, anyway, it's really powerful. Really, really powerful. Then there's a very uneasy and brooding slow movement. And then the finale is a march. And it's a march of, uh, you know, of, of total annihilation. It's, it's a mechanical march. It's wonderful. I mean, it has a great tune. First of all, and then there's the woodwinds go ee, 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 and the suspended symbol goes like this and that that just goes on and on and on until it reaches an incredible climax where it just obliterates itself it completely self-destructs and then quietly there's this 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 gentle string chorale diaphanous string chorale widely spaced harmonies with a piccolo a, you know a bird song sort of singing over the destruction as as you could either you know interpret it as you know death <laughs> or or a gleam of hope amidst the the rubble that's left and i think it's one of the most gripping finales that i've ever heard i'll never forget when i was um, at wjhu when i was in college you know as classical music director of the radio station i used to you know, I had a couple of shows, and I had a, a morning show, and there was an afternoon show, and I, you know, I did several of them. 
I played that piece, just the kind of piece you want to hear at the elevator when you're, you know, going up to your doctor's office, right? I used to, I was obnoxious. I was, I'm still obnoxious, but I was, you know, young and obnoxious. And I would play, you know, in the morning, I would do like tippets to Midsummer Marriage or wake people up at 7 a.m. with Electra, you know, things like that. So I put in the liturgique sometime in the middle of the afternoon. It was just before the news. And the news staff would come in and sit, you know, in the studio um, opposite me where we had all the turntables and whatnot. And I'm playing this thing. And they would be there like 10 minutes early. So they came in for the finale. And, and the, the woman who was reading the news was, was a friend of mine, but she was, she was a punk rocker. I mean, you know, as only college punk rockers could be, you know, it pierced everything and hair sticking out all over the place and tattoos and, you know, the whole deal. She was a heavy duty punk rocker, an absolutely delightful person. And she's waiting to read the news and I was playing this piece. And when it was over, you know, the piccolo was doing its thing and the strings were doing their thing. And she was crying. I mean, before the news came on, she had to like really gather herself. And afterwards she came in and said, that was unbelievable. She said it was the most moving thing she'd ever heard in her life. It was emotionally draining. It worked. And it was Honegger's third symphony. However, however, I have to give the the last, but certainly not least, bit of emotional drainage. And you know what it may be or should be or gotta be. It has to be. Mahler 9. See, Mahler gets two emotional drainages because Mahler is possibly the most emotionally draining composer that ever lived, um, at least in the field of mostly orchestral music, I, at least in my opinion. The Mahler Ninth is, is the one. I, I mean, it's the piece where you, you, you hear in music the ultimate confrontation with death, and then it ends with the most moving, intense, soft, incredible experience of, of dying that's ever been composed into a piece of music. And I've seen so many performances, including one I took my sister to with Bernstein and the Israel Philharmonic, where it just reduces you to tears at the end. It's so sad and so soft and so inevitable and gentle. It's, 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 it's the, the, the drainage is not like the sixth, where it grabs you by the throat and <laughs> shakes you around. It's, it's gentle. It's gentle because it's true. It's the true experience of, of life ebbing away. And ebbing is a synonym for draining. It drains away. And so it's probably the most powerful and evocative uh, musical depiction of that kind of, of, of just, you know, drainage. That's the word, drainage, um, that you could possibly imagine. So those are the 10, the 10 most emotionally draining pieces of orchestral music. Next, we're going to do vocal music. So, and the video's already done, so I'm sorry, you can't suggest them. Um, it's just a question of when I run it. Um, I've already made my picks, but when, when, so make your picks for orchestral stuff now, and then when we do the vocal one, we can talk about the vocal stuff. Let's try and keep them separate so that we can, you know, prevent the conversation from becoming just a, a, a farrago of randomness. I really like to stay focused on these things because remember, we're building a library for future generations. And, in, you know, when aliens, you know, see this in the year, you know, 12,367, they, we want them to think that we were able to stay on topic. I think that's important. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. Go get your drainage. Keep on listening, friends. Take care.